Welcome to First Chapter Friday, where I read the first chapter of a book that I hope you'll want to go ahead and finish on your own. My name is Kathy, and I'm a librarian at the Children's Library in Palo Alto. This week, actually this entire month, I'm trying to do spooky books because it just feels right as Halloween approaches, don't you think? So, the one for this week is relatively new, not brand new, but pretty new. It's called The Haunting of Henry Davis, and it's by Katherine Seibel, and it's really good. So, reading from the inside flap, as we do, ghosts only haunt when they've left something behind. When Henry Davis moves into the neighborhood, Barbara Ann and her classmates at Washington Carver Elementary don't know what to make of him. He's pale, small, odd. For curious Barbara Ann, Henry's also a riddle, a boy who sits alone at recess sketching in a mysterious notebook. A boy, she soon learns, who's being haunted by a ghost named Edgar. With the help of some new friends, this unlikely duo is off on an adventure to discover who Edgar was while alive and why he's haunting Henry now. Together, they just might help Edgar find what he needs to finally be at peace. So, here we go. The Haunting of Henry Davis, Chapter 1. The New Kid. If you want my actual opinion, I'd have to say that it comes down to this. Either you believe in them or you don't. Ghosts, I mean. Sometimes that changes suddenly, of course. Usually, when one shows up in the middle of the night. But let's just say you're a skeptic, a doubter, like I was. I can respect that. Then you have to start where I always do, with some research. And you have to be ready to uncover some things that you honestly can't explain. So let me just tell you this one story. It's about a woman in England who claimed her daughter was reincarnated and started to remember every bit of her past life. It seems they were driving in the country one day, and the little girl made her mother stop the car in front of this random house. She screamed at her mother until she did it, and then she hopped right out and pushed through the gate and ran toward this cottage in the middle of nowhere. Her mother followed her, of course. What is it? the mother asked. I think I used to live here. The girl said, I'm sure I did. Creepy, right? And how would you have liked to be inside, sipping your tea or whatever, when the two of them showed up? And then there are the kids with the invisible friends. Pretty common, really. Nobody else can see them except the kid. But they're all alone in their room, just chattering away. What explains that? Or sometimes it's an animal, maybe a dog, and it just stops in its tracks at a certain spot and starts barking like crazy at nothing. But maybe it's something less obvious, the way it was for me with Henry. I don't know how to explain it, except to say that from the minute he walked into Mrs. Binion's class on the first day of fifth grade, there was something, well, familiar about Henry which was impossible, really, because I'd never seen him before in my life. I guess you could call it deja vu, you know, the feeling that you already recognize a place or person from the first moment. It's a real thing, and nobody understands exactly how it works, except some scientists say it's your brain confusing the past and the present. Or maybe, like that little girl in England, it's one lifetime overlapping the next. I don't pretend I can explain it all, even after everything that happened with Henry. All I know is that Henry appeared that first day of school in the doorway of our classroom, and he was late. Binium was already taking attendance and telling us where to sit. Henry Davis, Ms. Binion said, looking around. Here, said Henry. He took a step toward her, no doubt trying to ignore the fact that every kid in the room was staring at him. Even aside from being late, Henry didn't make a great first impression. It almost seemed like he was trying hard not to. First off, there was the way he dressed. He could have made Guinness World Books for Biggest Nerd looking like that. His pants were much too short. His glasses were strapped onto his head with one of those elastic straps that should never leave the basketball court. And his t-shirt said, Karsov Chess Academy, your move. The rest of us were waiting in our pods, the little squares of desks that Ms. Binion had assigned us. Across from me was Zach Martin, the biggest kid in class. He had a buzz cut, 
braces, and a fairly bad attitude. Kitty Corner was Renee Garcia, who had the longest hair and the darkest brown eyes I'd ever seen. The next to me was an empty desk that I knew, somehow, belonged to Henry Davis. When Bidian sent Henry our way, Zach made a little grunting sound and said, figures. Then he slumped even farther down in his seat and stuck one big foot out toward Henry so that Henry tripped and crash landed into the seat next to me. That's how fifth grade started for Henry. Binium gave Zach the first of about a thousand glares she would aim his way before the year was up. And Henry? Well, poor Henry. He looked pale and exhausted. How else was he supposed to look? I didn't know it yet, of course, but that morning Henry Davis had seen his very first ghost. I couldn't do anything about Ms. Binion's seating chart, but outside class, I didn't spend much time with Henry at the beginning. My mother, like every mother since the dawn of time, always reminded me to be nice to the new kid. And it wasn't that I was mean to Henry. I said hello to him when he sat down next to me every morning. I was friendly, but I didn't exactly go out of my way to spend time with him. But that's just how it is mostly with new kids, especially at lunch. Well, apparently the teachers had noticed this too which was why we got all got stuck with this new program twice a week called Stir It Up Lunch, which is as horrible as it sounds. Everybody draws a colored slip of paper, and that determines which lunch table you sit at twice a week for the whole year. They don't even sort you by grade. Henry and I landed at the blue table with a bunch of little kids. The worst was this first grade boy named Rodney, he still wiped his nose on his sleeve. Rodney, I kept saying, do you want a Kleenex? No. Henry looked at me and shook his head sadly. So gross, he said. Rodney could hear him too, but he didn't even seem to mind. I'm losing my appetite, I said to Henry. Henry didn't answer. He was busy arranging each part of his lunch on top of his lunch bag. Cheese sandwich, carrot sticks, granola bar. I didn't even know it yet, but that was Henry's standard lunch. And by standard, I meant that he ate it every day for the whole school year, as far as I could tell. Not only that, but he ate it in the same order every time and finished each item before he moved on to the next. He's one of those kids who won't let any of the food touch on his dinner plate. Somewhere between the last carrot stick and the granola bar, Rodney sniffed so loudly, there was really more of a snort. The littler kids at the table thought it was hilarious, but Henry and I had had enough. We need to get out of here, he told me. And that's how it started. Henry and I would take a few bites, then hide the rest of our lunch in a jacket pocket and escape to the playground. Nobody else was outside yet, so we just started sitting together, sharing cookies under the slide. We didn't even talk much, which is unusual for me. We just sat there, chewing and staring at the wood chips. Once I had finished, I'd dust myself off and go get up to go find someone I knew. Bye, Henry, I'd say. And he would nod and take out his sketchbook. That's how it went for a few weeks. Henry and I left every stirred up lunch early, and the rest of the blue table just watched us go. Eventually, of course, somebody caught on. That somebody, in this case, was Mr. Simmons, the new science teacher. It was his first year at Washington Carver too, which was probably why he had lunch duty all the time. Anyway, he stuck his head under the slide one morning after one Monday afternoon and it demanded to know what Henry and I were doing. And the way he asked it made it sound like we were doing something way worse than finishing a bologna sandwich. If you aren't done with lunch, he told us, you belong inside where you can be properly supervised. How much supervision do you need to eat a bologna sandwich? That is what I was thinking. What I said, luckily, was nothing. But what I did was sigh loudly and roll my eyes. And I'm pretty sure that's what sank us. We got sent inside, but not back to the cafeteria. We had to go all the way down the hall to the principal's office. We had to sit side by side, waiting for him. Boris Borkowski, a huge bald man with a temper. More fortunate kids were leaving the office with their parents heading home with a stomach flu or on their way to have some painful dental procedure. I envied all of them. Simmons went in ahead of us to describe our crime in private. 
Then he motioned us into the office and left us there to face Mr. Borkowski alone. Do either of you know what the term in loco parentis means? Borkowski asked. Henry and I looked at each other, confused. Great. Now, on top of everything else, we were about to fail some pop quiz on weird vocabulary words. I got nervous, so I guessed. Crazy parents? I asked. No, said Borkowski. What it means, in short, is that for the duration of the school day, we are responsible for you. Ethically, morally, legally responsible. Henry and I just blinked and nodded. And it is very difficult for us to live up to that responsibility if students take it upon themselves to vanish in the middle of the school day. I was trying hard not to smile. It's something that happens when I get really nervous. Even worse, I felt like I might laugh. Fortunately, I was able to turn it into a pretty convincing false fake cough, and Borkowski let me go around the corner for a drink of water. When I got back, Henry was saying, You really shouldn't blame Barbara Ann. It was my idea. She was just being nice. I stared at him and opened my mouth to say something, but Henry kicked me on the shin. And Borkowski's desk was so big that he didn't even see it. Henry got away with it and kept on going with his speech. And really, he said, isn't that the whole purpose of this new program, to help students meet people and make new friends? Wow, Henry was really laying it on thick. Borkowski stared at him for a minute. And during that pause, the phone rang. And whoever or whatever it was, it was more important than the two of us sneaking out of the cafeteria. I don't want to see the two of you in here again, Borkowski said as he waved us out of the office. I'm not sure he even heard Henry promising that we'd stay in the cafeteria from now on. Thanks, I told Henry as we headed back down the hall. That was really brave of you. No, he said. I was terrified. Of what he would do to us, I asked. No, Henry said of what you would say if I gave you a chance to talk again. And that was the thing about Henry. Most of the time, he was so quiet that he seemed like this ordinary, almost boring kid. But then he would surprise you. I guess the same was true in a way about everyone in our pod. There was a lot I didn't know about them at the start of the year, and each one of them was keeping a secret. I just happened to figure out Henry's first. For weeks, Henry spent every recess off by himself drawing. He wouldn't show me what he was working on, but there he would be every day, off in the same corner, knees drawn up, head bent over his sketchbook. Curiosity was killing me, of course, but I didn't ask. I'm kind of proud of that. I've been working on giving people space, to use my mother's words. She says my energy can overwhelm people, so I waited it out, and one day he just laid the sketchbook down in the open space between us. And there he was, Edgar, Henry's ghost. I suppose you're picturing some Ebenezer Scrooge sort of situation now. You know, some ancient guy in gauzy robes, hollow eyes, dragon chains, that sort of thing. But you'd be wrong. For one, this ghost was just a kid. If it weren't for the weird old-fashioned clothes, he could have walked right into Ms. Binium's fifth grade class with the rest of us, and nobody would even have noticed. Who is he? I asked Henry when he showed me the drawing. It doesn't matter, Henry said. He isn't real. Oh, I said. You mean you just made him up? No, Henry said, I've seen him, but he isn't real. He isn't really there. My first thought was that Henry had an imaginary friend. But I mean, who has an imaginary friend in the fifth grade? Henry, I said, you're talking in riddles. I don't know who he is, Henry said, or who he was. His voice got kind of shaky and his chin began to wobble. All I know, Henry said, is that he follows me everywhere. And that's the end of chapter one. It's really good. I hope you finish it. Thank you for joining me for First Chapter Friday, and I hope you come again another time. Goodbye.